So thank you very much, Sean, for coming to our transplant school and uh, talking to us about the arcane world of pharmacy and medications uh, for transplant patients, which uh, those of us who had a transplant will know can be somewhat baffling and uh, also take, tend to take over your entire bathroom <laughs> cabinet at times. <laughs> So, you've got, so your slides are up, so I'll leave you to begin. And uh, welcome to everybody who's come back. And, oh, thank uh, you, Sean. it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm happy to, to take questions as we go if people want to put them in the Q&A and, and someone wants to field them, or I'm happy to wait till the end, that's fine. Um, so my name's Sean, and I'm one of the renal pharmacists here at Manchester Royal Infirmary, uh, part of Manchester University Foundation Trust. So I just wanted to give you a, a bit of an overview about what you can expect from the pharmacy team while you're an inpatient having your transplant and as an outpatient and what you can expect in terms of medication changes and a little bit about what you can expect from your immunosuppression when that starts. So the pharmacy team here at Manchester consists of the seven renal pharmacists at the moment. We've got pharmacy technicians. We also have medication administration technicians. Um, and you will see us as an inpatient. You'll, you'll see us, we'll, we will meet you when you're admitted to the ward. We'll join in with the ward rounds and we'll follow you up as an outpatient as well. All sort of centres have a slightly different setup and some people's pharmacy teams are bigger than others, but you'll definitely meet a renal pharmacist when you come in for your transplant. So what can you expect when you come in as an inpatient? The most important thing from my perspective is to ask you to bring your medicines into hospital with you. It's really helpful for us to get a really accurate, complete picture of everything that you're taking when you come into hospital so that we know what we need to continue, what we need to stop, and we can make sure that all your medicines are safe to carry on with your new anti-rejection medicines. We monitor your medications every day. There might be lots of changes at the beginning and we want to make sure that that's all okay and we're managing that appropriately. So we'll do that on the ward round with the doctors and we will come and see your medication charts every day. A bit like Guy alluded to in his talk, anyone who has surgery can experience some post-surgical symptoms and they might be pain, nausea and vomiting and constipation. There's some really common things that happen after most surgeries. And we can manage those partially with medications, with painkillers, anti-sickness and laxatives. Once you start to feel a bit better, like day two, three and onwards after transplant, you can start telling us exactly how you're feeling. So if your pain's getting better or getting worse, if your constipation is getting better or worse, or if we send things too far the other way and we give you some loose stools, always let us know about it. And there's lots of things we can do to help you. A key part of our job is monitoring and managing the new anti-rejection medicines that you will be started on after your transplant. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Other things that we do though are monitor and manage other medicines that you came in on. So that might be your insulin if you're diabetic, warfarin if you have had a clot or AF, or any blood pressure medicines if that's something that you took beforehand. And a really important part of our role is helping you to understand all the changes that have happened to your medicines and helping you to understand your new medicines regime before you go home. But it's really important to let you know that we don't just let you go home and dump you and off you go, sort out your meds yourself. We will, we will always be there to support you at once you're discharged as an outpatient and we can always help you with those medicines. So what changes can you expect to your medicines after your transplant? You will find that lots of medicines you're taking pre-transplant, particularly if you are on dialysis before your transplant, will stop because you don't need them anymore. And we hope that your new kidney will, will do the job that those medicines were doing for you. So medicines that very commonly stop before after your transplant would be phosphate binders, that's like calcium acetate, lanthanum, cervelomir, renovit, or any other vitamins that you have as part of your dialysis regime. Water tablets like fruzamide, bumetanide, um, medicines that we, we have on dialysis or pre-dialysis like Aranest or IV iron infusions. And we usually stop a lot of blood pressure medicines. Um, not always, and if, if hypertension is, is a, 
a, a big pre-existing condition for you, then we don't stop all your antihypertensives and we monitor your blood pressure really carefully. So the renal team, the nephrologists, the surgeons will all review these really carefully when you get admitted and they'll decide what they want to continue. If there's something they want to continue for a little while or maybe trial holding. And some of these medications may restart over time. And then medicines that will start after your transplant are your anti-rejection medicines. And they will continue hopefully lifelong or certainly for as long as the kidney works for you. Infection prevention, this is something that most patients don't know about. Um, some of this is to do with factors about yourself and infections that you might have had in the past. And some of it is to do with infections that the donor might have had in the past. So most patients end up on some antibiotics, usually called cotamoxazole, for six months after transplant. Some patients require antiviral medicines for up to six months after transplant. And some patients require anti-TB medicines for up to six months after transplant. And like we talked about earlier, we also start medicines to manage your post-operative symptoms, and they might be laxatives, pain relief, and anti-sickness tablets. Some transplants will, will start aspirin, but they, that doesn't always continue long-term. It might just be for a little while, and it might depend on which transplant centre you go to. A lot of our patients are surprised because they they feel like initially it's a lot of medication um, and it is a lot of medication initially but we often say that within the first two two or three weeks it does reduce a lot as your post-operative symptoms are resolving and we're managing everything and then and then again in the next three to six months it will reduce again so it can feel like quite a lot at the beginning but it will get better So to talk a little bit about your anti-rejection medicines, every centre works slightly differently um, and there are lots of factors that can determine what anti-rejection medicines your body needs. So it's difficult to say exactly what medications you will have to go home with, but to give you a, a, a bit of a generic overview, your anti-rejection medicines are sometimes referred to as your immunosuppression and that's because they protect your transplanted kidney from being attacked by your immune system in a process called rejection. Now, it's a little bit like what Judith talked about earlier in terms of the mismatching and finding you a kidney that's closely matched to your body. Because what we don't want to do is for your immune system to notice that that kidney isn't yours and attack it and reject it. So these anti-rejection medicines work by switching off or, or dialing down parts of your immune system to stop it recognising that new kidney. There are four main classes of anti-rejection medicines. Don't worry too much about these. I, I put them in there because I thought some people might like to have a little read about them afterwards, but don't worry if, you, if it's too much information and they're, they're ridiculously big words. But the most common ones that we see are tacrolimus, cyclosporin, mycophenolate and azathioprine. Sometimes we see sirolimus and sometimes we use steroids like prednisolone. The most common regime at Manchester is to have tacrolimus, mycophenolate, long term, and then to have prednisolone initially, probably just for the first five days or a couple of weeks. Sometimes if you come into hospital on prednisolone already, we will continue it. And if it's your second or third kidney transplant, we might continue prednisolone long term, but it's usually a lower dose, quite a low dose. And then the key thing is that the combination of and doses of the medicines you take will be unique to you. So it might be very different to the person in the bed opposite you or next to you, but that's okay. We, you know, we've taken into account all the factors about you and your new kidney, and we're going to make it as safe and as effective for you as possible. Some Questions that we get asked a lot about anti-rejection medicines are what happens if you miss a dose? So it's really important to take your anti-rejection medicines every day. And that's because they usually work in your body for between 12 and 24 hours. So we want to make sure that the, the level of anti-rejection medicine in your blood is high enough at all times to, to provide that service to stop your body from recognizing that kidney. If you do miss a dose, it's not always the end of the world and we will never shout at you. So if you remember within six hours, we would generally say to, to take that dose as normal. But if it's been longer than that, or your next dose is due, we'd say never double the dose, just take your next dose when it's due. If you find that your 
forgetting to take doses more frequently or you're struggling to take your doses, don't hesitate to get in touch with your team because there are lots of things we can do to support you. And that's what we'd like to do. So our goal is to find a balance between preventing rejection, minimizing infection, and minimizing side effects from these medicines. We do this in clinic, well, we'll do it when you're an inpatient and we'll do it when you're an outpatient as well. So we'll check your full blood count to make sure you've got all your white cells there, your neutrophils there, and they're all okay. Some of the medicines like tacrolimus and cyclosporine, we like to check the levels of. And that's because if your levels are too low, then you haven't got enough to do that job of protecting your kidney. But if your levels are too high, they can have some not very nice side effects and they can be detrimental to you and your kidney. We also check for infections, including viruses, and we will always let you know about what side effects you can expect from the medicines that you take and how to look out for those side effects and how to manage them. And sometimes that might be to let us know about them and there's always something we can do about it. We'll always work with you to change your regime if we can and make it safe for you. And then a key thing to know is that your anti-rejection medicines will be monitored and prescribed by your renal team. So your GP will continue to do all of your other medicines. Um, so any blood pressure medicines or insulin or antibiotics or anything like that will all come from your GP. But your anti-rejection medicines will always come from the renal team at the hospital. Now at Manchester, we've got a really good system in place where you can, it's the pharmacy team who predominantly look after that medication and you can ring us, you can email us and let us know if you have any questions about your medicines or if you need another prescription. Um, and we've got facilities to deliver medicines to you or you can collect them in clinic. I think a lot of teams across the country have got similar situation, uh, similar things in, in available and after, as a result of the, the COVID pandemic most centres will be able to deliver medicines out to you because we often find that some patients might live a little bit further away from their renal centre and it's not always practical to ask you to come in and pick up a prescription. When you start your anti-rejection medicines we'll give you a little card um, a little business card sized card to go in your purse or wallet and it'll have what what medications you're taking. And that's so that you can show it to any other healthcare professionals that you see. So that might be your GP, your dentist, your practice pharmacist, practice nurse, podiatrist, any healthcare professionals who prescribe you any medicines. It's important to let them know what anti-rejection medicines you're taking because some medicines can interfere with it and it can change the levels of the anti-rejection medicines in your blood. So that prescriber will want to make sure that anything new that they're starting is safe to take with your anti-rejection medicines. If you're ever worried or you ever have any concerns, you can always get in touch with your transplant team and we will check it out for you and let you know whether it's safe. And that's also applicable to herbal remedies um, and supplements and things like that. We'd always like to check that they're safe to take with your anti-rejection medicines. Always better to be safe than sorry. So in summary, your medicines will change a lot when you come in to have your transplants. It can feel like a lot of medicines at first, but this will reduce and this will get better. The transplant team and the pharmacy team on the ward will help you to understand that medicines regime and we won't leave you alone with it. We will continue to, to support you throughout your whole transplant journey. Your anti-rejection medicines will be looked after by the hospital renal team and they'll continue lifelong. And you'll have blood tests done in clinic to check that your medicines are safe and they're still effective for you. But in the meantime, while you're waiting for your transplant and you're on the list, top things for you to know about is to bring your medicines into hospital with you. Tell your transplant team about how, your how you take your medicines at home. For example, if you have your medicines in a blister pack or if a friend or family member helps you with your medicines or some people get um, phone calls or voicemails from services to remind them to take their medicines, let us know about it and we can work with you to find, find the best way to help you with your medicines. And keep up to date with your vaccinations. So all patients on the transplant waiting list and all patients after transplants are recommended to have their flu vaccine annually a pneumococcal vaccine every five years. And we recommend that everybody has their COVID-19 vaccine as well. And if you have any questions at all about your medicines at any point in your transplant journey, please ask us. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions at all. Thank you, Sean. 
Susan, do you want to? There's one at the bottom of the list. Well, it was just following sure. on. It was a question that was asked earlier, and I'm glad it was in your first slide about bringing in new medication from home. Mm. For so many people, we worry about waiting on the call. What happens if you forget to bring your medication? And we all get emotional and we can't remember what dose we take. What would happen in that situation? So it's no problem at all, don't worry about it. What we will try and do is compile as, as accurate a list as we can as possible. And if, if you're worried about it, we might ask if we can look at your GP record and use your, look at your GP list of medicines. And we can go through that with you and see if that jogs your memory. And if you forget your medicines, that's absolutely fine. If you want anything very urgent, things like insulin, um, let, let somebody know as soon as you get to the hospital and they can get in touch with the pharmacy team. Even if it's in the middle of the night, there'll be a pharmacist available to, to dispense those medicines for you. So it's not the end of the world if you forget to bring your medicines into hospital at all. And there's lots of things we can do. Thank you. And someone else is asking about pregnisterol. I think in your talk, you mentioned that it's only for a short time post-transplant that this person's been on it seven years. Now, I know that can happen depending on what unit you're under. There's different protocols. Can you maybe explain a little bit about it? So for somebody who's been on prednisolone for a long time, we wouldn't stop it. Um, there's lots of complications around stopping steroids suddenly, and we would want to avoid that. So someone who's been on prednisolone already, you might find that we increase the dose a little bit initially after transplant, but that should reduce back down to the dose that you came in on and we will continue that and continue to review it in clinic as well. And another one that's just come in, does add port cause, and it's written as no dat, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, N-O-D-A-T. So Adaport is a brand name, the drug is called tacrolimus. Mm -hmm. And there is some evidence that tacrolimus can cause it's no that is new onset diabetes after transplant. So Thank there is you. some evidence that that medication can raise your blood sugar levels and you can develop diabetes after transplant. We do monitor patients' blood sugars really closely while you're an inpatient. And if we have any concerns going forward when you come to see us in outpatients, we, we can do tests for that and monitor that and refer you to the diabetes team and manage that. It can be managed really well. Uh, Sean, <clears throat> oh, sorry, Sean, there's a follow up question to that about uh, whether there's any research taking place into no data or hyperglycemia post transplant. Oh, I'm sure there's, there's lots of research ongoing at the moment. There's nothing specific that I'm aware of, um, but I, I'm sure that is that that is ongoing. Yes. And there are guidelines up in the British Transplant Association about how, how to manage no data. Thank you. I had a question about uh, brand names. I've noticed uh, my uh, uh, transplant surgeon doctors have been very, been very clear that I must always remember the brand name rather than the class of drug, of course. So, you know, obviously I'm taking tacrolimus, but a very particular brand of tacrolimus. And I uh, just wonder if you could comment on that, because uh, I think it was a topic a number of years ago, uh, the, the uh, question of whether one uh, one should switch to generic uh, pro products or whether one can switch between brands. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the two drugs that we're particularly cautious with are tacrolimus, like you mentioned, and cyclosporin, which we use a little bit less now. And the most common brands are Adaport and Prograph, that's your tacrolimus, and cyclosporin is usually Neural. And we ask patients to remain on the same brand of those medicines because switching between brands might affect your levels a little bit. And those are the drugs that we monitor your levels on really carefully because we want those to be between some quite specific levels and um, so as we know they're doing their job safely. Now, sometimes it may be appropriate to switch brands, but that will always be done in the, the clinic setting and it will be very closely monitored and managed. We would never advise patients to swap brands just because that's what's available or because so someone's told them it's it's cheaper or better it will always be managed as part of your clinic appointment thank you we did have a question susan i don't know whether you saw that uh, relating to immunosuppressants and the effectiveness of the covid vaccination 
Yes, I was actually just typing a little answer for that. Someone would like to know, for those that are immune suppressed, post-transplant, does it affect your COVID vaccine and making it less efficient? Now, we know there are studies taking place currently in the UK, but are you aware of anything or able to answer at all? So at the moment, we're still collecting data from vaccinating not just transplant patients, but everybody who's immunosuppressed. Um, we think that there is a chance that immunosuppressed patients and transplant patients may not mount a full response to, a va to the COVID vaccine, but that's the same for most vaccines. Um, but at the moment, we, we don't have the full data. The information we do have suggests that even though the COVID vaccine might not be 100% effective in, in the transplant population, it's still going to be very effective and that the benefits of having the vaccine are, are very good. Thank you for giving that reassurance to our community today. Sean, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big advocate of the, um, the seven day pill box. Yeah, you know, to get to get organised, you know, so it's 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 sort of once a week, you know, sort of stock it up. But there's always this slight doubt that are is the medication now that it's out of the packaging, is it does it degrade in in that time? Sort of, it's just something I feel quite conscious of. And I've heard a couple of other people mention this as well. I wondered if you could comment on that. So some medications absolutely can degrade up outside of their packaging, and. Um, there's none, none of the anti-rejection medicines. I wouldn't be concerned about being out of the packet for seven days. If somebody wanted to make it up for 28 days, I might want to just double check a couple of things, but I, I think that the, the seven day boxes are a really good idea. That's what I'd do. Yeah, makes life a um, bit easier, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sean, I've also found very helpful an app that I have on my mm. phone, uh, recommended to me by my renal pharmacist called MediSafe, mm. which uh, enables me to track very eff efficiently um, how much stock I've got left, but also I'm able to put in when I've suspended or switched or uh, be moved around uh, different, um, uh, you know, different dosages over time. Um, so I don't know whether, do you also recommend apps? I know you mentioned a card, but personally I find I keep everything on my phone. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think we probably do need to, to look into some more up to date technology in terms of those things. We used um, the, the app called Transplant Hero. It's is very good um, in terms of reminding you to take your medicines. But absolutely, that app sounds fantastic. Um, and it, it, if it's helping you take ownership of those medicines and, and helping you to monitor them, them better, that, that's fantastic. And that's definitely something we should look into. Yeah. You, you also mentioned sort of timing of taking your um, uh, immunosuppressants, you know, so there's the 12 hour window. I mean, I, I just have an alarm on my phone. Yeah. You know, okay. Nine in the morning, 9 p.m. And it just sort of, it, it, it sort of ensures that, you know, you, I don't, I don't forget. Yeah. Danger yeah. causes if you, if you snooze it. That's what you've got to be careful of. Yeah. No, yeah, using alarms on your phone is really good. Some patients put their medicines next to their tea bags in the morning or next to their toothbrush in the morning. So it's the first thing they do when they get up or it's very visible to them. Um, we will go through everything together before you go home from the hospital. And part of that is, is going through your daily routine. And it might be that if you work shifts or you work nights, that you, your routine might need to be a bit flexible, but we can always help you work out what's best for you. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, we are given uh, we started a little bit later, we are now hang on time uh, to, for the end of this session, having started later. So I'd like to thank you very much, Sean. Are you staying on to the end? Yeah, if I'll be any... around at the end if there's any questions. That's, oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, because it might might be something coming up when yeah, after the uh, next session to do with post transplant clinics.